So for this um, kind of session, we're gonna be coming back to a demo that sort of fell on its face the last time we did it, uh, but um, I'm much more excited about it now. Uh, so we'll get into it a little bit. I'm gonna pull up my screen share here and you can see that we've got VS Code cooking. I'm going to uh, basically pull up this repository. So, if you want to follow along uh, later on, the goal when I do a demo is uh, almost always to make sure that things are reproducible for you in your own learning environments. Uh, and so you can head to github.com, stealthybox is my GitHub handle, and you can head to Capiflux demo. Uh, so what I'm going to be doing today is showing and demonstrating some of the more powerful features of Flux. Uh, Flux lets you do lots of very, it helps you get bootstrapped with GitOps quite easily. Um, but we want to see what does it look like, you know, when I am 20 days in and I have a need to work with multiple teams, you know, what if I need to work with multiple clusters? What are some different approaches that I can take to managing those clusters from a central location? Uh, and some of the remote cluster management features that we've introduced with Flux 2 are going to allow us to compose really well with cluster API. I'll be demoing a little bit of that today. We're also going to talk a little bit about GPG key verification. Uh, this is another thing that's uh, very popular in high compliance uh, environments, environments with sensitive security, uh, whether you're working in uh, finance or blockchain, you know, these are things where you want to very a verifiable audit trail that lets you point to things and say it's like, hey, we've attested that everything inside of this commit and the entire tree underneath it uh, has been signed off as okay by somebody. And so um, key verification in, um, in combination with Git can give you a lot more confidence. And then um, ideally I'll get a little bit to one of our uh, secrets um, signing or encryption guides. Uh, so if we look into the uh, at toolkit flexity.io, if you head to our guides over here, then in the Mozilla SOP section too, I'm going to be touching on some of this. Since we're already going to have a little bit of the uh, key infrastructure necessary to do commit verification, we can use those same keys as well uh, to do some secrets encryption. So pretty excited about that. Um, let's take a look at, so what I have right here is the repo pretty much cloned and let's check my status. We'll get rid of this extra folder that I made for now. So you can see that, uh, this is just what you would get when you clone the repository. Um, you're actually going to want to fork it, which if you take a look at the readme, that's the first instruction. The reason you're going to want to fork this is so that you can um, extend upon the work, right? So if you don't fork my repository, uh, then you're not going to be able to commit to my personal repo. You're not going to be able to make branches. And so while you'll have an environment that comes up on your cluster and is working, um, if you want to play with it, then you're not going to be able to make further adjustments. You know, so the goal here is to be able to add your own keys for the commit verification, as well as play with your own cluster API um, and create your own child clusters, schedule your own workloads. Uh, so go ahead and fork this repository. Uh, it doesn't cost you anything, obviously, except for that it's uh, publicly viewable on your GitHub profile. Uh, but yeah, I, I know I personally have avoided forking things before just because I didn't want my GitHub profile to be all messed up and stuff. Uh, I would encourage you, don't worry about that. Fork it, play with the repo. <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna start some things cooking here. I'm just going to run this kind create sh. And then assuming that succeeds, uh, I'm just going to preload some images into the... Uh, Cluster. Oh, that's right. I think I already made this. Let's see. Yeah, we have that control plane node running. Oh, I made it two hours ago already. And let's just check that there's nothing 
running in it necessarily. Eh, we'll just delete it. Cluster name and copy. I'll check that my Docker daemon is empty here, aside from just some Ignite related things. And let's go ahead and get the cluster started and loaded with all of the images that we're going to need. So I'm going to walk you through some of the things uh, that we're going to bootstrap into this cluster. So in this repository, we have Flux already bootstrapped. Uh, this is something that would happen for you if you ran the Flux bootstrap command, which we will be doing. Uh, one important thing to know about Flux bootstrap is that it is item potent. So if you were to say do something like Flux bootstrap, say you were to bootstrap a repo into your cluster and you give it a path, uh, you can run this multiple times on the cluster in a control loop management somewhere else like Terraform. Uh, and if there are already Flux manifests inside of that repository, they're simply applied to the cluster uh, and made sure that everything is up to date. So it checks uh, beforehand if the repo is there, and if it's not, then you're good to go. Here we see uh, the kind cluster that we're going to intend to use for our CAPI management uh, is started up, and then we're just preloading some images into it so that uh, other commands succeed quickly. So here we've got our cluster. And I'm going to do a cluster CTL init infrastructure Docker. Um, so just a heads up, if you're doing this yourself, especially if you're watching this recording in the future, uh, this is an area of cluster API that has changed uh, quite frequently. What we're intending to do here is make sure that the infrastructure provider uh, for the machines that will feed cluster API uh, will be available through the Docker daemon on our host. And if you look at the kinds config uh, inside of the repository that we use for our bootstrap or our create script, uh, you can see that I'm mounting my host's Docker socket. So what we're going to get here is a control plane node uh, running Kubernetes that has cluster API installed with cluster API provider Docker running with access to create other machines inside of Docker containers on my laptop, right? So this is my host's Docker socket. Um, this does change every now and then. Uh, so just as a warning, if it's not cluster CTL in it, infrastructure Docker in the future, uh, I'll, up, I'll update this um, CAPI init SH script, which is right here. Yeah. So let's, let's get cluster API provider Docker and the rest of the cluster API core into our cluster. Uh, this bootstrap setup uh, can be done in a GitOps native way, uh, but it does seem to require some additional steps that are specific to your setup. Whereas if you just use the cluster CTL uh, initialization, then the, uh, there's, there seems to be some extra PKI to get cluster API running. Uh, I haven't got it working with just the manifest being applied directly from the repository. But you can see some of the work that's necessary to do that kind of thing in the CAPI namespaces folder under config CAPI management cluster uh, CAPI namespaces. There's uh, the script necessary to produce the um, manifests for all of the individual cluster API components uh, and then output them to some YAML inside of your repository. Then you can, uh, when you do your Flux Bootstrap cluster CTL, and it will not need to be something that you need to run. Uh, it'll just bootstrap directly into your cluster. So uh, here we had uh, our init successful. So we've got a cluster up and running. Uh, it's just a plain kind cluster uh, with kind net and uh, cluster API provider Docker, otherwise known as CAPD. So let's go ahead and make a branch of our repository, because I want to be modifying things without messing with your demo. Uh, when you fork, you can just use the main branch. So I'll make GitOps days off of the main branch here. Oh, I think I can just check it out. There we go. The, we're on that same commit right here. And let's go ahead and 
If you look in the README, you'll see that there is, after you've got the cluster set up and that kind of thing, uh, there's a section on key verification. So it says right here, the most recent commit in this repository is signed by StealthyBox public key. That's me. <laughs> so if I do a git log and I show signatures, git log dash dash show signature, you can see right here, the most recent commits uh, all have a signature from me. This is my key uh, public ID here. And um, my local GPG daemon is also telling me that that key signature is uh, valid for this commit's contents, right? So uh, I have this disabled by default when you clone the repo, just so it doesn't break your stuff. But um, if you say were to uh, look at the secret provisioned by this repository into the cluster when it's bootstrapped, there's an admin public GPG key list right here in the Flux system namespace. So this is going to be installed next to Flux that has my public key here. And you could add your own right here as well. Here's a comment kind of explaining what this is for and why, you know, things that we've already talked about. And then if you look in the GOTK sync YAML, which you can get there by uh, navigating to it from the README as well. All right, so in the next statement here, it says, if you want to restrict the cluster to only apply commits verified by this public key list, right, the thing that we were just looking at, that secret, you should uncomment this verify section in the GOTK sync YAML. So right here, it says verify and mode head. So the very, uh, the very top commit that we are syncing uh, from the source, the Git repository source, we want to verify using this secret ref, the admin public GPG key list that we were just looking at. So you could add your own keys there or some keys uh, that come from your CI infrastructure to make sure that the commits that are being applied to your cluster uh, come from a place that signs them off. And so now that I have that kind of enabled, because we can see our diff here, uncommented that, I am going to make a signed commit. I want to make sure to sign this. And I'll say enable key verification for GitHub stays. So uh, I'll put in my GPG signing key password there. By the way, if, if you um, have never used GPG to sign anything before, you might need to add something like this to your bash RC, export GPG TTY, and then you have to evaluate what your current TTY is. Uh, so this is the, the pseudo terminal that you're using to type things in. That's so that it knows how to pop stuff up on your screen and so you can enter your password. And um, cool. Well, let's go ahead and push up. I think this is going to be a new branch uh, to my repository. And it said, yeah, yeah, we have a new branch. Cool. So now that we have our bootstrap repository set up and it has our key list installed and it's got our um, this is the GOTK sync YAML has the Git repository kind in it. So this is what Flux is going to use to sync the sources to the cluster. It's going to fetch our sources into source controller. And then we have the customization available to actually apply that to um, apply that source to the cluster. Right? So there's the separation in Flux 2 APIs between fetching and applying. This is something that I'm super excited about for Flux uh, because it's been a source of a lot of confusion before uh, with configuring the reconciler um, as to whether or not it has an error fetching the repository or whether it's an error applying the repo. Uh, and so now we don't have to worry about that class of debugging. I think it's going to really reduce uh, the amount of pain and frustration that people feel uh, when they are trying to figure out what's wrong with the system.
right. So let's get everything up and running now. Uh, let's do a flux bootstrap. Uh, well, hold up, I just have to get my GitHub token really quick. Uh, so that's my user being configured. And then I'm getting my GitHub token from a file that I have on the system uh, that I also use for my hub command line tool. Uh, this is in the readme here that just says, you know, find a way to get this personal access token. So uh, now that we have my GitHub token, I can do the flux bootstrap. And in a single step, uh, I no longer will have to be uh, making keys and that kind of thing. Let's look at the readme and just make sure I bootstrap the right repo. So yeah, I'm just instructing here to do your flux bootstrap uh, with your proper GitHub user uh, for your repository with this path. So um, might as well make sure I indicate that this is personal. And then instead of the uh, normal branch, I want to use the git upstays branch. But you'll just use your normal main branch if you're following along here. Uh, so what Flux Bootstrap GitHub, you probably you know, haven't seen this yet since it's new with Flux 2. Uh, we have a new command line tool that you can get from Brew. It's a uh, flux slash tap slash flux, brew install. And then um, you do this flux bootstrap command. What this will do is it will take the repository inside of GitHub um, at my user, and it will make a temporary clone, apply that to the cluster to make sure that the manifests are all only what's inside of the repository specified uh, at this under this particular path. So here I have config capy management, right? You can see I've got multiple config folders. Right. One is for the cluster that we are have just created with kind. Right. It's our Cappy management cluster. And then this has a flux system namespace in it. And this has the GOTK sync, uh, the flux you know, configuration, basically. It also has our key list as well as a customization YAML to include those components. Okay. Ah. That's actually going to be an issue. Just caught an error in my uh, customization YAML. Need to copy that relative path. There we go. I'm just going to do a kubectl apply. Uh, here. Well, actually, we should be able to do a bootstrap again if I just push that up. Should really do a customizer field more often when I add manifests to things. Add GPG key list to. Uh, GOTK config, let's say the flux config. And I want to also make sure that that is tip is behind. That's right. Pull in any changes that were made by flux directly. I don't want to merge this. So what we'll want to do here is just make sure that that one change that I made to the customization um, to include that as part of my flux config, the uh, key list that had my public key inside of it. I just want to make sure that that's pushed up to the repo and that I don't make any mistakes when uh, making that commit. So I want to make sure to amend it uh, with a signature. And I don't want to make any edits to the commit message. Uh, so if I go and I look at my git log, uh, I just want to show the signatures really quick to make sure that that's signed. 
the reason uh, we want to make sure that's signed is just so that it, it for sure gets applied to the cluster uh, when everything is bootstrapped. So we will um, go ahead and push that up now. It's looking good. And then I'll just run that item potent flux bootstrap command one more time since I made a mistake earlier. So this is cloned and then it just makes sure that those are applied. And then we'll go ahead and uh, get secrets just to make sure that everything's installed correctly. Inside of the flux system namespace, uh, there should be, yeah, right here, 12 seconds old, there's an admin public GPG key list. Right? So we've got this right here for the um, GPG key list. And then we also can not only just look at secrets, but we can look at our Git repositories. Right, so kubectl get git repositories inside of the flux system namespace, we can see there's a couple of uh, git repos that are already cloned just from bootstrapping our initial repository, right? So we bootstrapped one repo, but there's two repositories in here. You'll notice we have a copy of pod info. Isn't that interesting? So we'll talk about that. Um, also, everything is bootstrapped now and we had a working Cathy management cluster. Right. Uh, let's inside of the uh, flux system apply namespace, there is this child cluster YAML. Right. So the child cluster YAML is using the cluster API series of uh, API groups. And so we have a kind cluster in here with a bunch of networking information, a domain for that cluster to talk with its service virtual IPs. We have references to a control plane configuration that's supposed to be bootstrapped by kubedm. We have an infrastructure reference for Docker cluster. And all of this can be generated using cluster APIs tooling uh, so that you can start, you know, modify a much smaller uh, list of things. Because you can see that this uh, cluster definition is 123 lines long. Um, so lots of different things that you can um, play with here. But you can see a lot of this is just um, objects that are referencing other objects. Right? Uh, so just weaving together this kind of uh, like object, like relational object mesh, you know, of things to spin up your Cappy cluster can be a little bit of a challenge, which is why it's tool assisted uh, using cluster CTL. But this is inside of one of the directories in our Cappy management Git repository. We bootstrap this entire repository into the cluster. So if I do a kubectl get clusters, you can see inside of the flux system namespace, there is a child cluster that has been provisioned. And if I look inside of Docker on my host, remember that we had the management cluster mounting the host Docker socket. We have the child LB uh, as well as the child control plane node and a worker node that's been up for a few minutes here. Right. So um, I have a a little helper script uh, right here called cappy get kubeconfig. Let's just go ahead and run that. Now we have this kubeconfig here. And let's use that kubeconfig. It is in this directory. And let's just see if there are any pods uh, in the cluster. And then here we see that we have a dev namespace uh, that has a bunch of pods that are running in it. Uh, and that's actually part of the pod info deployment. So here in Flux System to Apply, we're using Flux 2's APIs. Uh, we have a single installation of the Flux system, but we can use this customization kind as well as Git repositories uh, in combination with uh, this Git repo and this customization to apply configuration that's synced inside of our management cluster using the kubeconfig secret ref from our Cappy child cluster to apply it across API servers. 
So we have a single flux system that's installed inside of the CAPI management cluster, and it's able to then synchronize Git repositories into the management cluster and then apply those resources to the target cluster. Right. So here as well for the customization of the pod info clone that we have using Flux inside of the management cluster, we're able to apply to the child cluster using its kube config inside of the Flux system namespace uh, to the dev namespace right here. Oh, sorry, this is a health check, but yeah. Ah, that's another cool feature right there. So if say we're back in the management cluster and we look at the customizations, uh, we can see here in the flux namespace here that for the child apply as well as the pod info that we created, uh, that we've applied these commits using the customization API to the child cluster. And then this is our management cluster. It's showing us that it's applied and up to date. And this is a good sign as well that the uh, customization for the management cluster is applied. Let's also just check in on our commit verification. So if I look at Git repositories here, um, as well, we see our clone of the GitOps days branch uh, for Cappy Flux demo, which is the repo you should have forked uh, on GitOps days at 2489. Compare that against what we have locally. 2489883 is the commit that we've signed. Uh, because it was signed and we have our repo verification set up, uh, this was this is working. So, so there's two concepts there. Uh, one is inside of the Flux system in the synchronization config for Flux, you can use the verifi verify. What am I looking at? Sorry. Sorry, one second, I got a little bit lost. Do, do, do. So yeah, if you were to go right here to this section, I'm just like not seeing. Oh yeah, this got updated by the uh, bootstrap. That makes sense. But yeah, the verify section of the uh, YAML there is what you use to set up the commit verification. And then an additional uh, concept here is that inside of the um, using cluster API, we can bootstrap a repository to create more clusters inside of some infrastructure provider. So in this case, we're using CAPD and our local hosts, Docker daemon. Uh, but this could easily be cluster API provider AWS or CAPV, uh, cluster API provider VMware, Azure. Uh, you could be creating clusters uh, inside of uh, a managed solution uh, such as EC2 uh, or other virtual machines inside of the public cloud, as well as support for things like EKS uh, that are experimental inside of the uh, cluster API provider AWS right now. Some uh, great members from our our team here at Weaveworks have been doing uh, work to get EKS supported in CAPI. So uh, I think we might have time, a little bit more time just to do, to talk about secrets for a second. So if you look at this guide right here, go to toolkit Flexity IO, and go to the guides and then Mozilla SOPS right here. Uh, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about using SOPs to store encrypted secrets inside of your Git repo, and then make sure that you can uh, have the key um, that you store inside of your cluster. You can generate a GPG key, put it inside your cluster, and then your cluster will be able to decrypt the secrets that you put into the repository. Right? So if you follow the guy here, again, it's, it's great because I don't think that a lot of people have really uh, run through the whole you know, feature set of using GPG. So a great learning resource here. Uh, we want to generate a key. And we'll do that for this specific purpose. Right. 
So uh, we will just use the normal default RSA here. Uh, and then, yeah, this is a pretty good key size, yeah, but you could go longer, I guess. And uh, I'm gonna make a key that doesn't expire in this case, but consider that you could run this from a controller inside the cluster uh, or use something like Vault to generate keys that are rotating and then make sure you just update your PKI. You would also need to update your flux configuration, uh, the secret key list that it's reading from, since you can put multiple keys into a key list uh, like this. Uh, if you're thinking about key rotation, that you see, I could like, you know, do this again and again, right? And then put, you know, stealthy box ASC with a particular timestamp. Uh, that would be completely functional uh, with the way that flux is built. So uh, key rotation is supported. Uh, we'll keep generating our GPG key here. Key does not expire, and this looks correct. So let's give this. Uh, this particular key is actually going to be the cluster signing key, uh, or rather the cluster encryption and decryption key. So let's just call this Cappy Management. And uh, we don't need an email address or a comment. Uh, this key is used for in-cluster decryption. And we will say that this is OK. Uh, passphrase for this, I'm just going to say Kubernetes. We'll take this one anyway. Yeah. And then we just move our mouse around and like stuff and wait for the machine to generate our key. So that's cool. Yep. Here's our key ID. So let's go ahead and put this into a secret. Uh, that we can use. We will basically I'm just going to throw this into here. We'll rename this. We'll call this SOPS key YAML. We'll do Cappy MGMT ASC, and then our GPG key block here. There. And then we just need to do a GPG export with this particular flag. It's dash A will give us the text, ASCII text of the Cappy management. I just auto completed for this key ID right here. That was just the output right there. And let's just put that onto our clipboard. And we will pop that into here. One thing you, you might not have known uh, this about Kubernetes secrets. Um, seen a lot of people before making secrets, you used to have to do a base64 encoded string here when you're defining secrets inside of your Git repository. Uh, no, and I'll remove this uh, comment. But if you use the string data field instead of just data, so data needs to be base64 encoded, and it's how it's literally stored inside of etcd. But if you use string data, this is a write-only uh, field in the secret v1 API. And so you cannot read back string data. Uh, the API server will just not return this to you. But if you use uh, this field inside of the objects that you apply to the cluster, such as something from a GitOps uh, enabled repository, uh, then you no longer have to go through this step of base64 encoding strings. Now, if you're using binary data, that's not going to be something you're going to want to store inside of a YAML file. Uh, so in that case, you would base64 uh, encode your binary data so that it could be properly decoded by a pod if you want to, say, mount a binary into um, a pod dynamically or something like that. So, But yeah, cool little hack there.
so what we're doing right now is we're adding SOPS key uh, to the Flux system apply directory. Uh, this does not have a customization YAML in here, so I don't have to worry about adding it to any manifests right here. It'll just get applied to the cluster directly. And um, now that we're going to have, I just want to, let's just call this SOPS GPG. We'll rename this. So we'll have the uh, cluster have a key list for encryption. And then if we go into our child apply YAML, which is what's actually applying this particular directory, config child inside of right here, then that means that I can put a SOPS encrypted secret into this directory and it will get decrypted before it's applied to my target cluster. So what I'm showing here is that you can inside of your fleet um, you know, management directory where you are managing the actual CAPI definitions of your cluster, you can bootstrap encrypted secrets into the target clusters. You can actually even bootstrap an entire flux system into a child cluster, but we're just keeping things simple here. Right. So I'm going to go ahead and put a SOPS encrypted secret into the config child um, directory. And we'll go ahead and just uh, make a folder in here for the default namespace, just so we can make a, a secret in there. So I want to, if you look at the guide here, uh, after you've got your key um, kind of imported into your cluster, so that's what this is, uh, exporting the secret key, uh, and then creating a generic secret uh, secret called SOPS GPG that includes uh, that, then um, we want to start encrypting our secrets. So what this will do right here, this kubectl create command, uh, is a dry run, and we're just using it to output some YAML. So if we go into our config child default, uh, default. Oh, yes. there we go, into our default directory, and then we just make that basic auth YAML, then what you get is a pretty standard Kubernetes secret. It's actually base64 encoded for us, but we don't have to worry about that right now. And then um, I'll just get rid of this creation timestamp. Doesn't have to be new. Uh, you'll see that this is a secret called basic auth uh, that's going into the default namespace. And I'm just reordering some fields here so it looks a little bit nicer. Secret, it's called basic auth. It's supposed to go into the default namespace. It has this content. Now, if we can committed this to the Git repository, it wouldn't necessarily be so secret anymore. Right. Anybody who had read access to that Git repo uh, would be able to know what that secret value is. If this is something like an API key, uh, you don't want you know anybody who joins your team, any developer, or if the Git repo gets leaked somewhere, you don't want them to have access to your API keys. This is really something that somebody should never even memorize or know the value of. Right? It's just copied and pasted into this file. And so the developer workflow for this is to use the GPG signing key. Right. So let's just go ahead and um, list our keys really quick. Right. And you can see right here, we have the CAPI management secret key. So I can take that uh, and then I can do a SOPS encrypt. And then with a particular key, right? So that's the same ID right here for the CAPI management cluster, I can encrypt everything in a YAML file under data or string data. So this is this encrypted regex feature, but you could encrypt a specific field if you want. And then we want to do that in place for the config child default basic auth YAML. Right? So if you read the guide, you know, you can adapt that to what you have. And we will go back up just so that the path is correct there for that encryption command. So you can see here in my editor, things just got updated, right? Uh, I never committed those actual secret, super secret base64 values. Um, the password was, I think, like 
change me or something, <laughs> right? But now we have a SOPS uh, encrypted file. And if you pass this through SOPS decrypt and you have access to the decryption key, then it will output a properly formed Kubernetes secret um, with these encrypted strings uh, kind of replaced. If you ever happened to use um, like Hira uh, with the encrypted plugin, uh, for, with the encryption plugin, then this will look probably very similar to you. So the idea here is that a developer doesn't necessarily uh, have to, uh, what am I saying? We use the encryption key and then inside the cluster, we put that public key to be able to read the message. So, um, did we, oh, we accidentally skipped a step earlier. I just realized as I was talking through that, it is going to be this right here. Oh no, we did this. Yeah, that's already gonna be done. Uh, instead of running that command and then installing it into the cluster, since we're just worried about uh, this is a, uh, we're supposed to be exporting the secret key here, not the public key. Yeah, let's go ahead and just do that. So that will not go into our Git repo. Um, copy management, apply, we'll get rid of this and then just put it directly into the cluster since it's super secret. That's what was confusing to me. So we'll come here and then we'll take that key ID, right? So here we're gonna export the actual secret key. Uh, so the, the private key uh, for the CAPI management cluster, install the private key into the cluster uh, using kubectl. We're going to create this secret into the flux system namespace, call it SOPS GPG. Uh, and that's gonna uh, be from this file. The key will be called SOPS ASC and it's just from standard in. So, and then this was just Kubernetes was our password here. Uh, so this was just installed into our CAPI management cluster. We can look inside of the flux system namespace, uh, get secret. And then right here, this is our key, our public key list. And then this is the private key for SOPS. So then SOPS will use the, SOPS will use the public key to then create these encrypted values. So as a developer, I don't need access to that private key. I just need access to uh, know what the public key is. And then we will use that public key to communicate to the cluster what the value should be in an encrypted format. And only the cluster is able to decrypt the value. Uh, so that, that would be these encrypted strings right here. And let's look at our status. We can add this directory. Since we're just, um, we have a customization on the entire child directory. I can add subdirectories, and as long as they don't have a customization YAML inside of them, then Flux will just uh, try to apply these YAMLs to them directly uh, to the target cluster. So git add, look at our status. Um, let's check our diff really quick, what we have staged. Uh -huh. And then we will make sure that this commit is signed so that it actually gets into the cluster. We can see our, our encrypted values, which are safe to put into Git because nobody except for the CAPI management cluster and me, because I generated the key, uh, can actually read these things. So let's create a signed commit. And we will um, um, create basic off for child cluster using SOPS. And this is going to be my signing keys passphrase. We look at our log just one more time to make sure that our signatures are correct. We have this commit that's not pushed yet that has a correct signature for me. Push that up to the cluster. And then sometimes this will reconcile very quickly. 
uh, but every now and then it won't. Uh, and we could be using a webhook, but in this case, we haven't installed one. So uh, here, our commit is 4B399. And then if we do a kubectl get git repositories inside of the flux system namespace, uh, then what was our commit? 4B399. So that has not been reconciled yet, which means that we could just do a flux reconcile source git flux system. When this gets git repository gets updated. So this is like similar to doing flux CTL sync, except a little bit more granular because now we can actually specifically say fetch this particular source. Right. Uh, so that flux system source should be getting updated rather quickly. Um, if we look at the git repositories again, you can see it's fetched my new revision. Now I'm interested, has that rev revision been applied? It's also a good sign that that's been uh, fetched. And then here we have unknown field stops. Uh, I see, might have to remove that. Um, no use errors, validation false. We can see if it was still applied. not applied. So this may need to be something that we look into, but I can try one more thing and just see. I, I do remember that this might be optional uh, when you're working with SOPs. So let's comment out this additional metadata. Um, this is useful for just basically instructing SOPs like how to decrypt the key. Uh, but we already have a config. Oh, never mind. Sorry, I missed one step. In the um, child apply YAML for the customization, I didn't instruct this. Uh, I didn't instruct our flux config for the child apply cluster to the using the child kube config to actually do any secrets decryption. This is the very last step. So right here, this decryption step, we just need to pop that in right under our kubeconfig uh, declaration. And that's at the right level and everything. Yeah, it's just underneath the spec inside of the customization. Yeah. So our uh, SOPS GPG key, we installed the private key inside of the same namespace here. Uh, so we can reference that directly. Uh, and then using the provider SOPs, we will decrypt that secret that we had just installed. Find that. I'll say we are configure management cluster to decrypt secrets for a child. Switch this up. And then we will go ahead and just poke the reconciler again, just to ensure that that's up to date. Uh, if we were to look at the log here, we're looking for commit 3B86. Uh, we check the Git repository. Inside of the flux system, we can see that that new commit has been fetched. If we were curious about whether or not it was applied to the cluster, then we would look at the customization. And then uh, still having a GPG uh, related error, I suppose. Looks like there is uh, a lack of a TTY uh, when using the public key. Imported. Yeah, that's all I did, right? Ah. Well, we might only be two for three on the demos today. <laughs> 
I was very excited to, to show you all some new features, um, but I may have done something improperly here, or we may have a little bit of work to do with either the uh, customization controller, customized controller, uh, or our guides. This is probably something small because you can see that everything is wired up for the apply properly here, um, but it's just failing to import the key. So we made a temporary decryptor. Oh, that's right. I put a password on the key. <laughs> that was a little bit silly. When I generated the key, I, I didn't read our instructions well enough, did I? Generate a without specifying a passphrase. That's where I made the error. So don't be like me. Um, if you're going to use a private key for automation, uh, then yeah, just just don't don't put the password for the key, and then everything wired up exactly like we have in this demo will work properly. So, <laughs> but yeah, um, I guess in uh, just to wrap things up, right? We've shown how we can use Flux to compose with cluster API. So in this example right here, uh, I made a management cluster. I bootstrapped cluster API providers into the management cluster. And then we bootstrap a single repository. This repository has configuration directories for multiple clusters. So our management cluster, the Flux installation is managed by GitOps the cluster that we create for the child inside of our infrastructure provider, in this case, it's Docker, it's managed by GitOps. The repo that we use to apply to that cluster, uh, it comes in this case from this same repository, but you could use a different Git repository. You can apply that to the cluster using Flux. You can apply other Git repositories, such as this application, PodInfo, uh, and a separate customization with its own apply configuration and health checks uh, to this target cluster using Flux. Uh, this is a single bootstrap from a single repository. And uh, here's that other configuration, right? So we were uh, applying inside of the management cluster, right? We have the CAPI management folder, but then you can see that the management cluster as well has a separate config to apply you know, our child folder to the different cluster using the kube config that comes from cluster API. Right? We saw as well how you can uh, make sure that only commits that are signed are, can be applied to the cluster and how the configuration for that is done with Flux so that you can get a more verifiable audit trail with who is actually applying commits uh, to your critical infrastructure. Uh, maybe this is not important for a development team, right? but for an infrastructure or platform team uh, with your own repositories for the things that you own, you can enforce commit signing. right? And then for some other development team that works on a sensitive application, they can do commit signing, but then for something less sensitive, you know, you don't need to have that policy. Uh, and so you can see as you can combine this multi-repo, multi-cluster, you know, remote cluster management features with Flux, uh, you can get, you can create some really interesting topologies that solve the social problems and the constraints that you are interested in building with your systems and how you work with your team. Uh, you can use the technical solutions and the interfaces that we built into Flux 2 and the APIs and the controllers that we built around it to accomplish uh, the these mature topologies. This is not playing with GitOps. Uh, this is GitOps that's ready for the enterprise. This is GitOps when you really, um, you know, like you can use Flux Bootstrap and get started up really fast. It's easy, uh, but this tooling grows with you. It's not a leaky abstraction. Uh, if you really want to know what you're doing, you can do exactly what you want. Uh, the tooling is not going to stop you. It's not going to encourage you to do something that's insecure uh, and it's very powerful. Uh, finally, uh, if you remember to actually read our guides, unlike me, uh, and you can create your uh, GPG keys without a passphrase so that when you install that private key into the cluster, you don't need a pseudo terminal to decrypt secrets, 
Um, so you can install this, these private keys asymmetrically into a cluster, give your developers access to the public key. You can use SOPs to uh, add encrypted secrets to say your child clusters configuration here. You can add an encrypted secrets and then Flux will be able to use that SOPs configuration uh, alongside the private key that you install into the management cluster to say, apply a secret to a child cluster uh, and have that be provisioned say by a platform team or an infrastructure team. So very cool stuff and uh, super happy to demo this you know, any day. Um, like really exciting features that we're, we're building with the best GitOps tooling available in Flux. So happy to take questions. Uh, if anyone's still tuning in, wants to know more about these features, uh, we're also super approachable on the Slack channel. Uh, we have a GitOps Slack channel uh, inside of the Kubernetes Slack. We also have Flux specific Slack channels uh, for community and development inside of the CNCF uh, community Slack. And you can reach out to us. Uh, I'm Kapili on Twitter and um, also on our Weave users Slack. So hit us up. Awesome. Thank you, Lee. That was great. Two out of three demos isn't bad. <laughs> I, I would like to think that it was like 2.9. Right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's 2.9. We just, I just try to put a password on everything. That's not something that uh, a robot likes to have to type in so yeah no worries <laughs> uh i don't see any questions in the chat right now um but i just wanted to wrap saying thanks to everyone who participated today thank you to our amazing dj daniel holbach dj desired state uh thanks to damani and bianca for being such great mcs today um alexis paul allison brees steve gavin uh, yvonne Tiffany, Matt, Michael, Kenichi. We had a ton of speakers today. So thank you all. Really appreciate you giving us uh, all of these great presentations. And hopefully the audience, you guys really got something out of this today. And don't forget to join us tomorrow. Um, a few other people that I forgot to thank because I'm just going down the list here are Kenichi and Matt Jarvis and Michael Hausenbloss, uh, David Allen, Luke Marsden, Scott Rigby, Cornelia Davis, of course, uh, and you, Lee, and LaTanya. Thanks so much for uh, sharing all of this cool stuff in the Unconf. Um, and we will see you guys back here tomorrow. Uh, really, really appreciate everyone participating today. And I'm going to put in some, uh, some tunes from DJ Desired State to close us out. Lee, did you want to take any questions online real quick before we close? Uh, we had one question from uh, Alexander in the um, uh, Slack chat for sure. the conference. Uh, Alexander mentioned, like, would we consider adding automatic generation for the GPG keys? Uh, and especially after uh, my uh, failure to create a key that could be used by automation because I filled in all the fields that it asked me to, uh, instead of reading the documentation, uh, which I think we've all been there. Uh, I think that that would be an amazing feature. And it's something that's super feasible as well. You can totally see how you would, uh, you know, potentially have a cluster auto-generate its own secrets. Um, one thing that you might want to consider here, though, is that um, if you're in a multi-cluster environment, or if you want to hand out multiple decryption keys, uh, to different teams, then you might need to have a declarative syntax for uh, managing those different keys and then uh, exporting them up to some you know, top level configuration. So uh, definitely some things that we could explore there. Uh, but I certainly think that that could be something we could look into. We should totally write up an issue uh, or a discussion. If you go to a discussions page uh, for uh, Flux2, so it's FluxCD, Flux2 is the repository that would uh, be the best place to explore adding that feature. Really great suggestion. So. And we can post that in the Slack channel as well. Uh, yeah. As soon as we're done here. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Lee. Really appreciate you being here at the end and closing us out. And uh, I will turn it off for now and we'll put on some tunes just to let run in the background. Thanks a lot. <laughs>